I don't know if everything you said was true. <laughs> it sounded like somebody else he was talking about. But uh, yes, I, I feel like I'm home. Um, at the time that I was still uh, young and working with the youth, uh, Belleville was a big part of, of the Federation. And so uh, I, I always, when I'm up here, try to scan and see if I, if some faces, not, I know I got older, and so do I have to remember that you also grew up and got older. You know, so just see how well you aged. If you kept your, your, uh, your facial, you know, structures and maybe the body changed some, because you know, the older we get, gravity is not our friend. You know what I mean? And so things happen to our bodies, but sometimes our faces remain the same. So I look and see, and a, a, a nice feeling comes over me when I recognize a face, and I just make sure, is it you? Y yes, it is. Then how's your sister? How was it? How's your mom? Well, parents I know by now have all been, most have been laid to rest, including my parents uh, many years ago. But uh, I'm, I'm glad to be to be here, and of course you, you guys know what brought me here. Um, it's just something that is part of life, isn't it? Amen. And um, uh, I know that the, uh, the Lynx family, especially uh, in these last few weeks and months, have been, uh, was rough to say the least. We, we, we were just attending funerals or, or memorial services almost back to back. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we kind of out of it now and we hope that it stays that way for a while. But, you know, life is so uncertain. In the midst of life, the Bible says there is death. And so we've, we've got to be prepared for that. Uh, the weather, uh, I have to get used to the weather here. It's, it's cold. And, and that wind. Is that, is, that the, is that what they call, Brother Roly, the southeaster? Not, not the northeast, the southeaster? Uh, I'm not good at direction, so I don't know which, where the, you know, where's south. But anyway, that's that. It's a strong wind. And I have to get used to that. I, I'm still getting out of a cold. I was down for two days flat in bed. But I'm here, and please pardon my snus from time to time, but I'm getting, I'm getting over it. And God has been really, really good. So thank you for the leadership in asking me to uh, occupy the sacred desk for a few moments. Uh, it's not something I treat lightly. Because from here, you know, you become the go-between God and his people. And so you want to be somewhat ready. Be that conduit that God can use to encourage his people and to bring a message of hope. And I trust that that will be the, um, the, uh, the theme for today as I, as I bring a, a, something uh, short. Before I get into that, though, I did promise that I will tell you what I do. I, I retired in 09. In 09 from the Michigan Conference with almost 30 years of ministry with them. And then I did something. I went into the workshop. They told me I was retired. So I took off the old tires and I put on some new tires. So now I'm retired. <laughs> and so, what to do, what to do, you know, when you're used to being busy and working, you find something to do. And among the things I do for my church, I had an invitation from AWR, as Brother Elty was just saying, would you join our team? What do we do? Well, we would like for you to join our team and, 
and going about our churches and encouraging them and letting them know how the gospel is going through the world field. And that sounds pretty good. That sounds like missions to me. Isn't that so? And I said, oh, you can sign me up. And then when I reflected on what they really wanted me to do, I said, I better just ask them not this year, maybe next year. But I said, you promised the Lord you would. And so I signed up. And boy, am I not sorry that I did. It's the most exciting work. How can you not enjoy it to, to, to keep track of how the gospel is moving through the world field? And as an ambassador, we have our, our meetings once a week on Zoom. We all get together and compare notes and, 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 and guys in the field, whether they're in Cambodia, or Vietnam, wherever they are, will give a little... Snapshot of what's going on there. This week, it's fresh. You don't have to wait too long. And then once a month, our president, uh, Dr. McKee, he, he, he does a nice report, prints it out, sends it to us all. So we, get, we write, on, we can see in real time how the gospel is going through the world. So don't feel like uh, you, you're the only people, the Adventists, you know, around. <laughs> you know, I go to small churches and, and let them know that, listen, there is more of you around the world. And they are coming in by the thousand. And when I talk figures to people, they think I'm... It's like fairy tales. Because you see, it doesn't happen where you are, and so you think that's, that's the trend. But it's not the trend. God's word is moving forward in leaps and bounds. AWR. So, you know, we use the radio, obviously. And the airwaves goes everywhere. Some person said to me the other day, you guys are the air force of the gospel. The air force. <laughs> because with the airways, there are no limits, there are no walls, there are no boundaries. Because it goes everywhere. Now there are still some places in the world that are hostile to Christianity, where our missionaries cannot get in. They don't want any religious activity. You can't sell books. You can't give away pamphlets of a religious nature. And some countries are really hostile, and they will persecute. And if you get into the Asian, some of the Asian countries, in Saudi Arabia, and the places like that, they'll cut your hands off if they catch you distributing Christian literature. And worse still, they don't wait too long. In Afghanistan, they chop your head off. And so, missionaries cannot go everywhere, but the radio waves can. Then they go everywhere. Amen. And they're coming in by the thousand. Right here in Africa. Folks, right here in Africa. The work is growing so quickly. And it's almost doubling the membership here in Africa to the rest of the world out there. How the church is growing. Two years ago, in uh, Zambia, in Livingston, uh, and what's the other capital? Uh, Lusaka. AWR was preparing. Now that we, you know, we send little radios ahead of us to all these ones in, in the third world countries, mostly. And somebody was asking me about, do you have a radio to spare? And when I go to churches here in, in the States, they're always asking, can I have one of those? No, you can't, because these are for those people that, that don't have the means, and also uh, it's, it's for them in the rural countryside, in, in, 
in the desert areas or mountainous or in the valleys. These little radios, uh, battery operated, just the little ones, about, about that size, about eight inches by, by five, they are battery operated, but they're always working. When the batteries run low, they are equipped with solar little panels in it. So they solar charge and the batteries get charged. Amen. So when my friends are sitting under the trees, shepherding whatever they're doing, and it's a bad day, not to worry, there's also a little winder charge uh, to it. So if the solar, if the sun isn't out, they can always just crank it for a minute or so and the batteries are fully charged. So they're hearing the gospel constantly. Isn't God good? And so here they hear the wonderful stories of salvation. They hear about Jesus and, 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 the, and the gospel story and music. And then they get told how to make contact. And they have been coming. They have been coming to the nearest churches. People have been knocking on the church doors and, and, and asking, is this the, the people that go to church on a Saturday? Yes, it is. Oh, are we so glad we finally found you. Can you baptize us? Then there's 50 outside. Two people are talking and 50 are waiting to be baptized. They're walking themselves into the church. And I think there's a message there. God is saying, if you guys are going to be slow, I'll just use the Holy Spirit to send these people to your church. That's the message I get. But it's so wonderful that this is happening. Pray for the Adventist World Radio team. And if you can, and we don't always ask money, when we go to talk to people, and even in our churches, we don't take up an offering when we tell them about Adventist World Radio and its work. We don't take up an offering. We do ask that if you can and you'd like to, if you can maybe just forego a cup of coffee for a week at Starbucks or wherever you get it, put it in an envelope, that money, then send it. And God will multiply that because it's expensive to erect these towers and the antennas for the broadcasting stations. It's very expensive to do. Talking about the, the towers, we started out, I think the work started out in, in uh, 1971 when, they, when General Conference took over Adventist World Radio as an authentic part of their ministry. And the island of Guam is, is really well situated for this. God gave the vision that if you put antennas on that little island, that'll be a good start to broadcast from. And in 1975, there were three of those towers, and we were broadcasting in 20 different languages at the time. Fast forward to today, we're still using that same island. There are seven towers on that island. And with the power that it generates, we can reach one third of the world's population just from that island. And I tell you, the work is growing in leaps and bounds. Now, I always say this, and I mean it, Money is not everything. Now, we can do without it, but it's not everything. And when it comes to the gospel, the last time I checked, the gospel was free. The gospel was free. So, we don't charge people for the gospel. We don't uh, beg for money to pay for it. It must come from the heart. You have to sacrifice if you want to see God's work grow. Right? It must come from the heart. 
And that is why we never take up an offering, but we encourage people to give. And so the money is always there. Uh, people bequeath, there are different plans. If they want to be honored, they can. And the money just flows in like you wouldn't believe because it's very expensive to erect these towers and, and to do the broadcast. So pray for us as we, as we do this fine and lovely work. We have to talk about something that's on my heart, and I'm sure it's on your heart as well. Before we do, let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we pause a moment in your presence, Lord. Pardon. Because we are about to speak about things eternal. And I pray and ask that you guide my thoughts and thinking, Lord, as I share a few thoughts this morning. And may those present in this place do the same so that they can receive what is being said and what is coming from the sacred deaths this morning. And now that at the end of it, we may all be stronger and stronger in the faith to trust and then to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I think it goes without saying that, you know, we are living in, 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 in serious times. Right? The, the last uh, time prophecy has already ended. 1844, it was all done. And now we have lived to this day after that. And we know that Jesus is about to come. But this world is not getting better, and it will not get better. I don't know what's going on, but it seems as if the leaders of this world are just gone off the rocker, as it were. That's crazy. Everybody is in it for some kind of power. And they calling bad good. Have you noticed the talk that is going around? Oh, that shoe is bad. But they really mean it's good. So, so when they look at sin as just a, a passing phase, it's something, it's not that bad. And when it comes to leadership, to governing countries, everybody seems to just want to overthrow the next one. Dictatorships. And where I'm from, I'm living right in the eye of the storm. You know, the USA is in prophecy. And you can see it developing right in front of your very eyes. We have government that has gone off the rocker. I like what the songwriter said, we are living, we are dwelling in a grand and awful time. And then he goes on to describe what he's meaning by that. We are just all gone the other way. Power hungry is, is the right way to put it. And Russia came over there to Ukraine, blew up men, women, and children, buildings, just wanted to overthrow and to take for himself. That's, that's how they are. China's already sitting, going into Taiwan and just saying, you belong to us now. Come over. If you don't, we'll just shoot you up and we'll take you by force. That's the world leadership today. And almost every other country, North Korea, Iran. And the world is just trying to appease these strong powers so they don't get hurt. Leadership has gone haywire. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about a different style of leadership. Shepherd-like leadership is what we want to talk about. And... We'll talk about the Good Shepherd for a few minutes. We'll talk about his sheep. 
And as I was looking at it, it's, I said, you were talking about the 23rd Psalm, really, yeah. Yes, it's true. I couldn't find an, a good reference. Psalms 23 came to mind immediately. Immediately. And you know, this psalm is, is a very popular psalm. For, for, for centuries, people have been using this psalm. I know. It's some, a psalm that is well loved by old and young alike. And the states think that this psalm belongs to them. It's called the American psalm over there. And, and all the clergy of all faiths use this psalm at weddings, funerals, graduations. They're they, they proud to read aloud the 23rd psalm. Then, of course, the psalm, as we said, somebody said this morning, I think in the lesson, it, uh, it's David's psalm, right? David is the author of the psalm, and I mean, he's an authority on sheep and shepherding, so why shouldn't he be the one to go to if you want to know about sheep and shepherding, right? Because he knows sheep very well. He knows their temperament, he knows their diseases, he knows... Uh, how to care for them, because as a little boy, he was with sheep all the time. He knows where to take them by the still waters. You know, sheep don't like rushing water. They like quiet water. Then they're happy. So he, he took them, and he writes about the still waters, right? And he knows good pastures. They like good pastures. He knows about the lambs in the flock. When there are babies in the flock, he knows not to drive the rest of them, but gently, there are little ones among you, type thing, you know. He also knows about the troublemakers in the group. He had all that experience. That's why he always had a rod. See, and the staff. So David was an authority. He knew his sheep, and the sheep knew him. So I like to think of this psalm, as really a relationship thing, I think, between the good shepherd and his sheep. And so that's what we would like to see if that is really true. But you know, to fully, to fully understand this psalm, Psalms 23, we can turn with me there. If, if we fully want to understand the 23rd Psalm, we seldom consider the 22nd Psalm. We seldom do that. We, um, we go straight to the 23rd Psalm and read it and enjoy it. But the 22nd Psalm tells us about the death and sacrifice of Jesus. If you want to get to know the shepherd, you may as well want to know who, who he is, what his character's like. And Psalms 22 will tell you that. And then Psalms 23 itself talks about uh, the ministry and the compassion of Jesus. So here in Psalms 22, here is revealed to us the true picture why our loving Savior is the only one, the only one that can lay claim as the good shepherd. Jesus is the only one because of the qualities presented in chapter 22. So, I, we cannot go and unpack it. It's beautiful. It makes a beautiful study. But just, just, just very briefly, when you look at verse 6 of chapter 22, and by the way, the utterings here, the expressions during the time and around Jesus' death and crucifixion, was prophetic because these were, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. 
David had these prophetic messages. The things Jesus was thinking on the cross and the things he said was given to him. And when you read Isaiah 53, the same thing. But here was David. He was not only a king, a shepherd boy, uh, a priest, but he was also a prophet. And verse 6 says, says this of 22. My God, my God, uh, sorry, verse 1. It, it opens this way. It opens this way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where did you hear those words before? Is it, wasn't that exactly what Jesus exclaimed? Exactly. And if you, if, you, if you go down the line, you'll see what Jesus was thinking and some of what he was saying. Just quickly, just at random, yeah? Verse 6 says, I am a worm and not a man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. Was that true of Jesus? Yeah, he felt like a worm. He felt like nothing when they spat in his face and pulled his beard and scourged him. He felt like nothing. David saw all of that in the future. Verse, verse 7 and verse 8, all those who see me they ridicule me. They shoot out their lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him and let him deliver him. Those are words that people were saying while they were there. And, and, and it was all recorded. All recorded. Then we go down. Let's go right down to verse... 31. And I mean, you please spend time this afternoon and read the whole of chapter 22. You'll get a different view of your wonderful shepherd, Jesus. And then all the way down to verse 31, and it says here, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. That he has done this. Now done what? What did he do? He had done this. The people will declare, when, when, the, when the generations go on and on, there will come a time when there will be a group that will be born and they will declare that he has done this. Now you'll notice in your Bible, it's in my new King James Version. If you have the King, the, just the King James Version, it should be italicized as well. It's written in italics. When you see something written in italics in the Old Testament, it means they couldn't find the right word for it. So, so it, it means... Uh, Something else. It, or it can mean, because, uh, you know, the Old Testament were written in the Hebrew, in the Aramaic. So when we translate it, we just can figure out what is meant or it covers a few things. Those words are usually in italics. And this word, this, is in italics. And so, what does it mean? What did he do? He has done this. That's what it says. Well, he had done what he had to do. He had to complete the penalty for sin. He had to do it. He had to do that. That's what he did. That is the this. Friends, he paid the price that sin demanded and became the supreme sacrifice for every human being, past, present, and future. He didn't try to circumvent the cross. All these things in 
Chapter 22, he could not prevent. He was not asking for a substitute. He did it because of his great love for his children, for his sheep, because he was the shepherd. He was not a hireling. Hirelings run away when danger comes. He went through death for you and me. He didn't run when the predators came, when the enemy came. When the enemy demanded, you die. Blood has to be spilt if you want a clear record. And Jesus said, I will do it. I will do it. Wow. And so John, as we read 10, 11, and 18, says, I'm the good shepherd. Jesus said, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am that good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. And this, my friend, is Jesus, our, our good shepherd. So after reading, reading uh, Psalms 22 then, now we are ready to tackle Psalm 23. We know he is. One who loves us very much, one who gave his life, and he went through all these things. That's the shepherd that we're going to read about in Psalm 23. Now you have a, a, a better view of who your shepherd is. One that loves you supremely to, to giving his life. You know the psalm very well, so we won't read the psalm uh, per se. But as you read Psalms 23 and read it with meaning, what I mean is, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, I want you, as you read it this morning, say to yourself, put yourself there and say, the Lord is my shepherd. Mary's shepherd. John's shepherd. Sally Shepherd. Put, your, put yourself in those words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. You see, if you read it that way, it becomes personal. Don't think of David now. Don't think of David now. David was saying this of himself about his Savior. But we living today, say it to yourself. This is for you and me. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm not sharing him. He's mine. You see, and then we go through that. Pardon my sniffs. I, I, I'm getting over it. And so, so you read it that way and you see how God has brought you through all these rest stops, the quiet pastures, the, the resting night and day. And then verse 4 and 5 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are um, with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See? Personalize it. Personalize it for you today. Now I need to tell you that choosing this metaphor was very divine for Jesus. Him as a shepherd and us as sheep. You know, a powerful God who gave up everything in heaven... Angels waiting for, on his beck and call. He left it all and came down to this earth. Get an idea of that. But then he calls us his sheep. His sheep. But very appropriately, I think, to using the metaphor of sheep for his children because they fit the profile perfectly. He didn't say, you are my bears. Uh, you are my antelope. You are my spring box because you're very fast. No. He chose the sheep 
and it fits so well. You see what? Sheep are very dependent animals. Sheep are very dependent. When you, when you think about it, and if you think, if, 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 well, let's say, put it this way. If evolution is true, it did nothing for the sheep. It did nothing for the sheep. Because when you look at a sheep, it has no defense mechanisms, nothing at all. They don't have sharp claws like a lot of animals have to, to claw at their, their enemies. No. They're just sheep. They've got no sharp teeth that they can sink into the, the predator and bite them. No, they don't have that. They don't even have horns. Their cousins, the goats, have the horns. But they don't have horns to goud the enemy. Pretty useless. They don't even have a hard kick. They can't even kick their way out of a problem. That's the sheep, totally defenseless against its predators, its enemies. And just so you know, we are no match for our enemy. Because we are likened to sheep here. We are no match. We are dependent. We are but sheep, and we have gone astray. Furthermore, we're not done yet. The sheep, they have poor eyesight. You see them walking in a bunch. They're always bumping into each other because they just hope this guy in front of me is going the right way. I'll follow him. And that's why they stray a lot. Do you see yourself? Do I see me as a sheep? We're good followers. That's what we are. You see, we follow each other. In fact, when it comes to spiritual things, we measure ourselves among ourselves. That's what we do. I, well, at least I go to church three times on the month. I'm there every week. You know, she doesn't do that. I give so much, he doesn't. I, I belong to the men's band. He doesn't belong to the men's band. We measure ourselves among ourselves. Sheep? Yes. Yes, sheep. That's what, that's what we are. They stray easily. They have no leader among them. A goat usually does that part of the job. So they follow the goat. Dependent, dependent creatures. But they have one good thing. And what do you suppose that could be? The sheep have one good thing. Brother Vaini, what, what would you say it is? Okay, all right. Yeah, all right. But, but, as, a, but as, a, as, as something tangible that the, the sheep possesses, and that is they've got excellent hearing. They listen. I, I, I'm going to choose my words right, not listen. But they hear very well. They have good hearing, good hearing. And that's their saving grace. That is their saving grace. You know, they had an experiment one day. They had three, four shepherds come down to the valley, bring all their sheep there. And so the sheep got together and they started mixing. And, and uh, they were enjoying making friends with others, and soon they were nicely enjoying themselves. But then the time came to go home. And the shepherd says, all right, we're ready to go home now. And you know what they did? They just each one took a direction, and they started calling their sheep. And the ears perked up. And they just found where the voice was coming from, and that's the way they went. 
That's the way they went. And it wasn't long. The valley was cleared, and the sheep had all gone with their shepherds. They had good hearing, and they knew the shepherd's voice, and they were safe in their crawl that night. And they went and followed, even though they didn't see well. I, they, they heard the voice. They heard the voice. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're thinking at this stage, but and young people, you and I hear the voice calling. Sometimes we hesitate. And I'm talking now about the voice of, of Jesus calling you and the Holy Spirit prompting you. This is the way, walking it. We hear, but we are so slow to go there. And we know that our eyesight, our spiritual eyesight, is not that hot. And then we lose out. Then we lose out. We have to trust the shepherd's voice completely. It's a matter of life and death for the sheep. If they didn't go towards the voice call, they would wander away and maybe fall down a cliff. And so the shepherd knew his sheep. And as long as the sheep will respond from where he is, the shepherd will go there to rescue. Amen. And so with Jesus calling us sheep was very appropriate. We are just like sheep. Now, we have to exercise genuine faith in the shepherd, and that's how we're going to get home. That's how we're going to get home. And how does one acquire that trust and that faith in the shepherd? I mean, we, we like to know how that is brought about. How do we acquire the faith, even though we don't see the shepherd. And many people ask the question, if you were Christians, have you ever seen God? No. Have you ever seen Jesus? No. Have you ever seen an angel? No. But you, see, you follow. Who are you following? It's hard for people who don't believe to follow or to trust what you are saying. So how do we acquire this faith? And would you believe it? Turn to, John, uh, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And we'll find out how, how we get that faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And what does it say? Would you believe it? That faith comes by hearing. Would you believe it? How do we get this faith to trust our shepherd? Hey, that's the one thing we do have. We have hearing, good hearing. So faith comes by hearing. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. And hearing what? What do you want to hear? Hearing by the word of God. So how do you build your faith? This is how you, you build your faith. Hearing, reading the word of God. That's where the faith comes from. That's where faith comes from, friends. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, David said. Psalms 119. Right? And a light unto my path. This is where we get it. This is where we get it. And if our hearing is good, if our hearing is sharp, we in good shape. We in good shape, friends. Because as we study God's word, as we read, let us read with purpose and intention. I, I, 
I give high marks for people who read the Bible through once a year or every other year they read it through. But I prefer rather to take portions of the scripture and read it purposefully. Wasn't it Jesus who said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So we sometimes read God's word and make the verse say what we would like it to say. But we must read every word. And I mean every word. I discovered that when I went back to school. I came to this country. I had a family already. And uh, I was late 30s, I think, towards 40. And I went back to school because I wanted to find out what, what is it about God's word. And I discovered only then this little verse that said, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth. And when you read a text, please consider all those prepositions, all those articles, the thes and the ands and the es, and all those subordinate clauses of condition. Don't just go over the verse and get to the end product and say, oh, it's talking about faith. Or it's talking about hope. No, 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 no. Read the verse word by word by word. Because in there you'll find the real stuff. And when I discovered that, a whole new world opened up. A whole new world opened up. Now I'm reading every word. And ask yourself, every time you read a verse, ask yourself a couple of questions. What, what does this verse tell me about God? First thing, read. Now, okay, I've got it. What does this verse tell me about God? Then, the next question. What does this verse tell me about me? How does this verse apply to me? You see, you've got to, you've got to read with the intention. And that comes with the help of the Holy Spirit. Don't ever open this book without a prayer. Before praying. You know? Because God wants to, this is his word, and he wants to talk to you when you pick up that book. And so, uh, let's, uh, let, let's move on, because I'm noticing the time is running out. And so, we must get to God's word if we want to improve on our faith. That's what we're talking about. And so, I want to ask you today, I'll just, I'll just come right to the point. Are you willing to be a student of God's word? Do you want God to be the shepherd in your life? Amen. And would you be willing to listen to his call? Amen. There's a beautiful picture that you all know with Jesus standing at the door knocking. And he's, he's waiting to come in. But he's not going to force his way in. He's asking, would you open the door so that I can come in and sup with you? And that's the call. We hear the knock loud and clear, but are we listening to the call? And that's the other word that I didn't want to use earlier. Sometimes we hear, but we don't listen. We hear, but we don't act on what we heard. And I'm just praying, friends, if you feel like I feel, that every single day is a time for, for reading God's word. And you must be purposeful, though. You have to open your Bible each day. If you want to grow in faith, you have to start maturing. You have to start maturing in the truth. In the truth. 
Because God cannot help you if you don't want to. He's knocking at the door and he's wanting you to open the door so he can dine with you. The last thing I need to leave with you is, you know, earlier we talked about measuring ourselves among ourselves. The other thing is we, we become so complacent. We're very happy to be where we are. Ons kom elke sabbat kerk toe mos, ons sing lekker, bid lekker, lesson study is perfect, and then when we leave here, we got this whole six days in between until we meet again. And it, it becomes like, you know, something we do. I'm not saying it's, it's a bad habit, but we cannot remain in that groove all the time. You see, we, we are good, you good, as you are. But you cannot remain good. You cannot just stay good. You cannot stay good. You have to get better. That's what it is. When this young ruler came to Jesus, remember this rich young ruler, flamboyant? Pardon me. He came with haste to Christ and he said, Good master. Good master. And Jesus looked at him, full of life, good Christian boy. He said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the whole story. And Jesus said, Oh, oh, oh stop a minute. Why do you call me good? And maybe he had reason to call Jesus good because he must have seen him maybe performing the miracles and so forth, all the good things. And Jesus said, no, I'm not even good. There's only one person that is good. You see, good is a person. It's not something you do. He said, my father is the only one good. I'm not even, you saw me, you didn't tell him that in so many words, but he was inferring that you probably saw me do these things in your mind are good things. And we do many good things, friends. We do many good things, but you cannot remain good. You were good last week, you were good last month, last year you were good, and you just stay good. You know what will happen to a company if they just stay good? Every year when they meet, those of you that are in business, and you go over the books and say, we made a good profit. Last month we made good. Now we made good. So now, gentlemen, ladies, around the board table, what are we going to do next year? Oh, we can stay good. We have to do better. Now we're going to improve. You cannot stay good. You've got to get better. God wants to see us mature in this wonderful truth. Do you know what I mean? Somebody once said, uh, good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better best. You, you just get to get better. You can't just be good all the time. And so as we consider, as I close, what we're going to do with our lives in the next week, next few months, can, can we become better? by studying and getting to grips with God's word, we little sheep can grow. As we heard, we can hear, hearing, faith comes by hearing the word of God, studying the word of God, and then becoming better. We have to mature in the faith. We have, we have to mature, and as we look at each other, sometimes we just don't see that maturity, and that should happen. So let me ask you, is there anyone here that would like to say, Lord, this morning I want to do better. I want to grow in your grace and in your love. I, I want to read your word a little more. I want to study more. I want to pray more. The desire for do the, doing these things is, seems to want to leave me. I want to do that. Can you help me? If you feel like that, 
just raise your hand so I, before I say the prayer. Say, Lord, I want to do that. I want to uh, be a better Christian. I want to serve you a little better. I'm not going to look and see what my neighbor's doing. I want to see what I am doing for you. Heavenly Father, you see these hands raised this morning. I just pray and ask, Lord, you come into each one's heart and you bring the blessing that they so uh, very well need. All of us are in need of your grace and your power. And we ask the Holy Spirit to make that possible. Help us to be students of the word. Help us to be good sheep and help us to depend on our Heavenly Father is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.